Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with two very special guests, repeat guests, Glenn Well and a friend, Tomer Kagan. Glenn, Tomer, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, Tomer, of course, you're the uh, co-founder and CEO of, of uh, Sigma, uh, and Glenn, you've, uh, you're a co-founder of, of Rad Exchange as, as well as a, uh, uh, an author of Radical Markets. Glenn, you've recently come out with a, a, a series on uh, decentralized identity and, and identity more broadly, and, and Tomer, of course, Sigma is a company in, in, in focused in the space. Why don't we start with you, Tomer? Why don't you talk about what Sigma is trying to do, what its goal is, and what inspired you to, to start it? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, we actually just rebranded as Merit a few weeks ago. So uh, the, the company won Sigma is now Merit moving forward. Yeah, so, so we've been dealing with identity the last few years, actually. The whole idea for the company really kind of came from this, this idea that while we talk about identity a lot as a society, we keep saying it's like our phone number, it's our social security number, you know, our, your identity is stolen, uh, you know, Facebook is all about identity. The way the world actually works, you know, is very different. For example, you can think of identity in, in two different buckets. And this is kind of what really inspired us. You can think of things as like declarative identity, which are things like I like the color blue or you know, I'm really, really good at like, you know, a motorcycle racing or something of that sort where you yourself are kind of saying how you want the world to respond to you. And there are a lot of platforms like Facebook and, you know, like LinkedIn, which are great for sort of your declarative identity and kind of broadcast that for the first time ever into the world. Uh, but the way the world's worked for thousands of years is on verified identity. The, the kind of the idea that your identity is built up from pieces of truth that institutions in society say about you. And so though the reputation of that institution follows with you somewhere else where you get value for that identity. So to to make that simple, it's like a driver's license, right? Like when a cop pulls you over, they don't go, hey, can I test to see whether you can can drive? They say, hey, can I see your California driver's license? Because the California DMV has already done that test and I'm going to trust that they know what they're saying. And what was sort of the philosophical underpinning behind you pursuing this idea out of all the ideas you, you could have pursued? What made you fascinated about, about this? Well, I, I think it's that, you know, I think it's, it's so fundamental to, like, to everything, to society, right? I mean, you know, when I say for thousands of years, I mean, the whole point of government, the point of many institutions is to be able to create classifications for people and then create opportunities for those specific individuals. You know, I, I was trying to figure out kind of a lot of what to, to do. And it wasn't like I was looking for an idea. This sort of came about when I was hiking in Belize with a number of friends. And we just realized, you know, we were kind of joking, actually. I had a friend who basically forgot uh, his, his paddy license and couldn't go scuba diving. And so we we're kind of joking about the fact that you can say you're a scuba diver, but if no place in the world will actually let you scuba dive, can you really be considered a scuba diver? In the same way that, for example, if you go to your friends and you say, I ran 26 miles in the mountains, I ran a marathon. Well, I don't know, like, did you really run a marathon? Is a marathon on your own running 26 miles? Or is a marathon the act of getting verified within a certain amount of time? We just started realizing that there is a certain structure how the world's built. And no one has actually, you know, tried to sort of tackle that and make sense of that. In fact, you know, even today, you talk a lot about things like, you know, there's a lot of news around crypto, a lot of news around blockchain and decentralized identity, a lot of news around things like sovereign identity. But before even building completely brand new systems for society, we haven't even really attempted to, you know, just modernize the way society already works. And that's a nice segue to, to Glenn. So, so Glenn, I initially reached out to you about doing a, a repeat podcast and you wanted to make sure uh, that, that we brought in uh, Tomer. Why don't you talk a little bit behind why you thought it'd be so interesting to bring him in and wh- where you guys sort of differ or have sort of nuanced difference of opinion as it relates to identity. That, then we can get into some of the stuff behind your most recent articles. Yeah, so let me um, start with the areas where I really see eye to eye with Tomer. So I think what's so fundamental about what he's doing and, and some of the things I've been trying to work on is that I think the internet was fundamentally missing two pieces when it was first created. One was an identity function and one was a truth function. And I actually think those are two sides of the same coin because without a sense of a verified, clear notion of who you're speaking to, 
there's so little that you can actually do in this world. So much of things we do, everything from democracy to cooperation, depends on a sense of who it is we're interacting with, at least at some level. And at the same time, truth depends on that. So one of the big reasons we have problems with things like, quote, fake news, unquote, on, on the internet, is we don't actually know or trust the sources of the information that we're receiving. It's not linked to someone's reputation and identity. And conversely, to have any sense of who someone is, we need some, as Tomer points out, sense of who it is that's willing to vouch for that person. So there's this deep relationship between identity and truth in both directions that was sort of missing from the underlying architecture of the internet, but that is critical for so much of what it is we want to do with the internet. Now, I think one thing that subtly differs between Tomer and myself is Tomer's language tends to rely on the notion of institutions as the basis for providing these credentials. And while I'm happy to accept that as an interim, ultimately my vision would be to actually disaggregate those institutions themselves into imagining them as just networks of individuals and communities in which we share notions of truth, which could, you could call them an institution, but I would view them as sort of even more fluid than that. There's just sort of subsets of people in a network that can attest to certain facts and people will have different degrees of trust in those participants in the network. And, you know, an institution might be a particular place where there's quite a bit of trust that lodges in there. But ultimately, I'd like to see as much as possible truth just flow sort of directly through networks and the trust that lives in them rather than through marked off centers of power that you call institutions. Tomer, would you, would you uh, say that that a disagreement is, is accurate? And if so, what, what sort of assumptions un- underlie that difference? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. I think that there, there's a, a distinct difference there. Uh, although I will say, you know, I think the work Len does is, is fantastic. And I, I couldn't agree more about the need for the internet to have sort of identity and to have truth. And I agree 100% with him that the two are interlinked. You know, I think where we differentiate is that, you know, I believe the way the, the world's basically designed itself is the creation of institutions is sort of a way to formalize uh, a reputation. So I'll give you an example. Let's say some guy off the street, average Joe, wants to make a statement. And say, the statement is that, you know, his friend Mark is, is a great surgeon. And you should trust him and you should let Mark perform surgery on you. Now, you might trust Joe, but you don't know what Joe's incentives are. You don't know if Joe's incentives are for Mark to perform the best surgery, for Mark to get a job, to see if he can just convince you to let Mark perform surgery on you. So a lot of really big unknowns there. And what Joe would do if Joe was a professional and he actually became someone trusted is he would probably start to streamline his process, right? And streamline how he starts giving these sort of attestations of truth out and possibly into some form of credential that is recognized and some sort of institution then that would take the responsibility and liability and risk for these statements. One of the differences between a certain individual making a statement about one person and an individual making a statement about a lot of people is the notion of centralizing risk, right? And and we see this a lot today with things like Facebook and so forth, where when you centralize risk in one place, meaning, you know, single points of failure, you basically need to actually increase the responsibility. The reason institutions started to exist is the need for it to be more than one person who's being held accountable and needs to have, you know, checks and balances because such big parts of society started relying on sort of these attestations of truth. So while I agree with Glenn, my disagreement is just that I think that we've been through the cycle. I think we started as a society as individuals making statements and we've evolved a complex system of, you know, or government organizations and non-government organizations who have taken those roles and accepted as those roles in society. Yeah, and I think this is another area where Timur and I really do agree, which is that I do fundamentally believe we need various forms of collective organization for precisely the sorts of reasons Tomer is saying. I think maybe our biggest difference at some level is almost a matter of time horizons. I think that over a somewhat longer time horizon, maybe not that much longer, but somewhat longer, we can actually have a society where we actually have the technical substrate in this sort of network thing for sort of institutions to just emerge naturally from these networks and to then, you know, maybe decay over time. 
whereas Tomer is sort of trying to say, well, look, we already have these institutions. Let's just formalize them into the system rather than actually building a substrate in which they emerge, play that role, and then sort of decay. And um, I think those things are basically consistent with each other. It's just sort of a matter of how far down the road and how much flexibility you therefore want to provide in, in the technical substrate. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, actually, if I can jump in there, I think, I think, you know, I think we both agree, you know, generally in the notion, I think basically the, what structure that takes in the future might change. I think one area that's actually interesting is where we agree about sort of who owns this truth, or maybe we disagree possibly. But, you know, I think that's something that people talk about a lot these days is sort of data ownership. And I think it becomes really interesting in identity, that data ownership, right? Because, you know, in, at least in the model that I just described with institutions, you know, I imagine a sort of data model where those institutions and those individuals share in the ownership of that data. For example, the same way that if the DMV gives you a driver's license, you know, it's, it's a shared driver's license. You're both saying you institution at the same time, yes, this is true. And if any one of you sort of disagrees, it would sort of null and void that truth. Is that similar to how you kind of see it? Yeah, absolutely. I think the only difference I would say is that at some level, I, I view the institution itself as just a collection of people. So what I really think of is that every da datum is sort of going to be collectively owned by a set of people. And at some level, I think the real difference, if there is one, between our frameworks has to do with the way in which I'm trying to sort of have institutions be generated within the system itself eventually so that they can just sort of emerge from patterns of interaction and therefore sort of create an institution out of those networks of interaction. But this basic idea that we have to have sort of a common ownership of these data because truth is actually a social property. It only emerges from the relationships people have among each other. Your example of the marathon, I think, is perfect. What makes something a marathon is a social understanding. I, I wouldn't necessarily label it with an institution, but it's a, it's a common shared social understanding among a set of people to believe in that thing. And, and that is critical. And, and the, what was missing from the internet is that effectively social substrate for the notion of truth. Right. I think, you know, a lot of the problem has been the internet is that we've, we've been okay substitution, you know, substituting the notion of identity with the notion of behavior, right? So we say, well, we've been able to watch certain behavior and therefore make certain conclusions about this sort of individual, even though that behavior is data that we've collected from, you know, many, many sources might not be accurate. And then we kind of lump sort of these behaviors and we start targeting against that. And we call that identity, right? We, we think the internet actually uses identity, but it, it's really not. It's using a very complex set of aggregate understandings that work on the average, but we'll never be able to personalize truly to the individual. Yeah, uh, can, you, Tom, can you talk a little bit about what Merit l look like if it achieves all of its goals <laughs> it, or, or how the world will change if in a world in which Merit becomes, you know, enormous company and achieves its mission, like flesh out a little bit more, you know, as, particularly as it relates to identity and truth, what that world might look like. Yeah, yeah. So let me give you like a couple of examples. So today we power skydiving in the United States. So that means, for example, if you receive your, you know, U.S. Parachute Association Class A license, you can get a Merit for it. And that merits a digital representation of the license. And let's say you want to go and sign up for a jump. You want to go and jump from a drop zone. So you can use a software called Burble. It's the number one manifesting software in North America for, for skydiving. And you can literally sign in with Merit today and give it, basically, you can permission, because uh, we really believe a lot about identities, about permissioning and consent. So you can permission then access for that app to see your skydive merits, which then it personalizes for you the jumps that you're able to, to go into. And the idea being that when you actually then sign up for a jump, your information, your license information that allows you to make that jump passes through and you permission it to the next drop zone. Meaning, think of it this way. Uh, I'll give you a, a better example in, in a sense, which is it turns identity into credit, into basically what Visa did with credit, right? There's a lot of stuff happening in the background, right? There's a lot of sort of you uh, as an individual permissioning out you know, your, your identity to an organization, that organization has to be able to collect it, has to be able to use it in the same way that basically, you know, Visa made credit liquid where you don't have to make individual deals of every single store you go to. We're trying to make basically identity liquid where 
you don't have to think about it in the background. You just know that you can show up, put in your merit account, and whatever licenses are necessary get transferred through. You know, it gets checked, it gets approved, it gets verified, and you just pass through without having to do anything. Never take your wallet out, never have to really think about it. So that's kind of what we're doing today in skydiving. We're also doing this in, in states. So in California, we just signed to basically uh, power the collection of all sort of volunteer emergency services. So things like CERTs, which are community emergency response teams. And I'm really proud to say that on September 3rd, we're going to be launching in Virginia with the Department of Professional and Occupational Licensing. So a few hundred thousand people who basically get their licenses like architecture license, law license, real estate license, et cetera, uh, all through our system. So that's what it looks like today. I think, you know, what we really see sort of as the goal of, of Merit, kind of what we're doing at scale is once you have all that data, once you have all those, you know, all those merits out there, you can really start connecting opportunities. And, you know, it's kind of a shame in society today that like we can create policy and a policy could say something like someone who's part of this benefit program shouldn't have to pay this fee. But just because we say it doesn't mean it happens. In fact, the dissemination of policy is extremely difficult. Our hope is that with you know, enough merits in the system, policy can be automatic and opportunities can be automatic, meaning that if there's an opportunity that I should be aware of because of my special, you know, special circumstance, it should be able to come to me uh, automatically. So that's kind of how we envision merit in the next few years, sort of as it scales. Glenn, why don't we get into your, your three-part series on uh, the case for decentralized social identity, maybe starting with the, the, the first one about how you uh, talk about, you know, how can we escape this nightmarish oversimplification that technology foists upon us, to, to, use, to use your words? Yeah, so I think that the essence of uh, what we're writing about is very related to what Tomer is talking about. It's, it's that our identity, who we are as people, is constituted of a whole bunch of information information that goes, I think, well beyond even what Tomer's system would attempt to capture, not just credentials or things like this, but everything from our location uh, over time, the emails we've sent to all sorts of different people, who we are friends with, all this sort of stuff. So there's this, all this information. But the key thing is that this information is not, quote, personal or, quote, private. All of it is shared with others. So my mother's date of birth is also my mother's date of birth and my sister's mother's date of birth and my grandmother's date of the birth of her first child, right? And so we have to realize that every datum that constitutes our identity is also constituting the identity of people other than ourselves. So you can really think of us being made up not just of a bunch of data, but of a set of links that each of these data have to other people who sort of are also partly constituted by these data. And this is actually an idea that goes back a long way in sociology to a thinker named Georg Zimmel, um, who was one of the founders of modern sociology, who really thought of us as being constituted by the set of intersecting communities that we're a member of. And that that's really what created our individuality. That in the modern world, the reason why we have this sense of individuality that didn't exist in primitive societies is because the set of communities that make up different parts of our identity are not all the same. They differ depending on the different parts of our identity. And it's that richness where all of our identifying information is on the one hand, social, but on the other hand, part of different social groups for each element that we think is really critical to uh, capture in an identity system for it to be true to, you know, the nature of what truth is and the nature of what identity is. How do you think about uh, pseudonymity as it relates to identity moving forward? Yeah, so that's a great example. So to me, the essence of what's broken about identity online is that we either have on the one hand this category which we could call anonymity or pseudonymity which is used in many places or you have to like give some rote standard set of information on you know date of birth social security number on on websites and the thing is both of these are incredibly stupid paradigms 
The the anonymity pseudonymity thing is a disaster because it allows trolls, bots, all sorts of fake accounts to just pop up with no accountability. In almost every circumstance, there's some information you want to know in some verified way about someone in order for them to be participating. And there needs to be a substrate for sharing that information. On the other hand, almost never is it the case that like all that information that you in a rote way usually give that's your identifying information is even the most relevant information to be sharing. You know, if I'm going on some sort of a dating site, you don't really care about my precise date of birth. You don't really care about my social security number. That's not relevant to dating. If I'm going on Twitter, that stuff is not relevant to Twitter. What's relevant is instead things that are that I'm actually trying to prove in that circumstance about myself. It might have to do with some credential I have. It might have to do with whether I'm actually in the places that I'm claiming to be in a, in a regular manner. So if we had a system that actually allowed us to prove precisely what it is that we need to be proving, and only that, we could completely escape the anonymity, pseudonymity versus identification paradigm, which is what we do a lot of times in real life. It's not like every time you meet someone at a cafe or whatever, you are proving to them all those things, or you're completely anonymous. Instead, they learn certain information about you, which is relevant often through an introduction from a friend or from some contextual information. If we could online share that sort of information, then we could create personae, which were neither just invented, nor are they just a single persona that we carry around all over the place and therefore allows someone who knows about us in one context to hack us in other contexts, we could share the relevant information for that context in each context without giving away the rest of the things about ourselves. So, so does that look like me having a different name across these different platforms? Well, I mean, the notion of name is even kind of funny, right? Because like, what is your name? Names are actually a reasonably recent historical invention in their modern form. It used to be that you would just be the person who did some profession who lived down the street from some other person in some village, right? And maybe there would be some name associated with that, but usually it would have to do precisely with your profession. So the point is, like, what actually constitutes your name is some set of things about you which are relevant to the context. And so, yeah, you could have different names in different contexts, but not, neither would it be something that was just invented and specific only to that context. It would be something that was actually relevant about you and that could be proven about you, but um, wouldn't uh, have to be the same thing that you're using in every other setting. How do you think about, or how are we going to think about reputation in the future? Obviously China with what they're doing has one model of what reputation could, could look like, but how do you think that's, that's going to play out? Well, I mean, to me, the key problem with both the Chinese system and with things like on Uber and so forth is that as Tomer was putting it earlier, they're fundamentally not, personalized. They're not viewed from the perspective of whoever it is that is evaluating them. There's some global number. But the thing is that in, in real life, that's not how reputation works. You know, Eric, I think something about you based on our social relations. You know, people have told me good things about you. We've we interacted. I have a perspective on you. But everybody else in the world has a different perspective on you coming through the different social channels that they come through. And that's appropriate because, you know, all of us, you know, maybe have done good things for certain communities and maybe others we don't have good relations with and so forth. Rather than having this single global notion of reputation, I think what we need to do is use the fact that different people have different trusts in different institutions and social groups and that those social groups have given different credentials or reputation to individuals to each form our own view of how we should evaluate something. That social rather than global or objective notion of truth is, I think, what's kind of wrong with the way that, for example, blockchains think about things, where things are either completely private or completely public. Instead, things belong within these different social groups and institutions that give us each a different view of our social relationship to other people. Yeah, I have to actually really agree with Glenn here. I mean, you know, I, I think, for example, we see this all the time, right? Someone may be an amazing skydiver, but, uh, you know, for all you know, 
they're terrible at other things or they're, you know, kind of a jerk, right? It doesn't really speak to them. But in the context, let's say, of a skydiving competition, you know, you really want to know who the best skydiver is, right? So I think, you know, the point reputation really has to do with the community and sort of the, the lens it's being seen into. But I also think, you know, Glenn, that reputation is something that is, is, has a network effect. So, you know, um, in, in the example that you gave about people putting out sort of statements of truth about other people, the, the problem with that has to do with sort of that connection. So if, you know, if one person, let's say like someone named Joe is making a statement about another person, you know, Sally and Joe's reputation is, is hurt, then that statement about Sally is now put into question. And so I think, you know, I think because society has this sort of objective view of reputation and not this sort of critical view of reputation per instance, it actually makes it difficult to, to have reputation built by individuals making those statements. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the way I would, I would think about what you just said, Tomer, is to say that because there's a network effect, reputation will tend to concentrate on certain people because there, it's sort of a rich gets richer type phenomenon. And those people then effectively become like institutions or something like that, because the fact that people trust them gives them more opportunities to get trusted and so forth. And I actually think we need institutions, formal social institutions, or rules of the game that help to bridge those communities and, and avoid too much of that concentrating in too few hands. That, that gets more into the sort of social design, political economy side of the work that I do, into which the types of systems you're designing are critical input and the types of things I'm talking about are critical input, but there are also additional layers on top of that. You know, you talked about sort of the Chinese, you know, social system. You know, what's your view on sort of any sort of social system as it's to do with like the, the kind of information being collected? You know, for example, you have negative information or positive information, right? A lot of stuff we've been talking about, things like credentialing and so forth, are positive. Like, this is extra capability or you passed this test. And, you know, and I, th- I see a lot of what you know, China is doing is basically collecting people's sort of negative identity, right? Like, this is a fine or you didn't do this or this is a, a, a statement of truth that's negative about a person. Do you see there being any distinction between the, the sort of you know, positive identity and negative identity? I think that's a real challenge. I think the difficulty there is that, you know, both you and I have this vision where people are presenting their own credentials or their own information. It's a little bit less clear how that works for negative information, because you you could rely on the mechanism that people will have an incentive to provide their negative information, because if they don't provide it, then people will assume the worst of them. But then there's a question of even how much information is out there to be presented. And so... It's gen- that's genuinely a tricky issue, Homer, and I, I, I haven't made as much progress thinking about that. I don't know if you have. You know, n- not really. The only thing we've kind of come across was that it's, and it's also better for, you know, markets to have the notion of, you know, a positive statement as it sort of erodes any fear of a negative statement. Like, for example, you know, d- you know instead of saying, you, you know, negative aspects of your identity on a driving record, uh, having positive aspects, like, you know, this person has a clean record. because one of the things is, you know, with identity is you have to mirror identity with consent, right? So anything about people's identity, the question is going to become also, how is it shared? You know, do they want to share it? Are they actively sharing it? Are they making it available? Or are they going to try to hide it? So I think one of the challenges in society we have is, you know, we want to make all this information available and, and free and loose. Uh, but at the same time, we want to provide people the ability to select. And that creates almost like a gamification, right? We can we can show you only the aspects of ourselves we want to show you so that we get what we want instead of showing you our entire selves and letting you decide. Yeah, I mean, I think one potential way around this, but I haven't thought it through enough, is that if you allow some service or some institution to report the set of all possible information about you rather than the actual contents of that information. So for example, something could track the set of all Uber rides that you had given, but then it doesn't track the feedback and you have to choose to share that. Then at least someone would be able to know what you're choosing not to share, or at least you'd be, you'd have the capacity to share with them what you're not choosing to share 
which could provide more context for the positive information that's being shared. You see what I mean, Tomer? Yeah, no, definitely. I think what you're saying is you, we want to discourage as much as possible sort of uh, bundling together sort of the whether the information is good and bad or bad versus sort of the most neutral form of it. Yeah, whether it exists or not at some level, exactly. you know, yeah. Just to, to perhaps summarize for the, for the folks at home some of the things we've been talking about, is, is it fair to say that the internet has assumed sort of this philosophical point that there's sort of one true self and, and that true self should exist across, a, across platforms? Well, I would actually say that the internet is not, like the internet really doesn't have any notion of human identity at all or truth at all. There's just pa- packets floating around. And at some level, you can think of the business model of Google and Facebook and why they've made so much money is that they were trying to reestablish some notion of truth and identity. You know, like basically Google made most of its, much of its money on trying to say, okay, this website is more reliable than that website, right? And Facebook did it on the basis of identity. So effectively, they were trying to establish truth and identity functions on a substrate, a decentralized substrate that was just missing that. And then blockchain came along and blockchain said, no, there's going to be some global notion of truth based on what's on this blockchain. But the problem is most truth is just not global. Most truth is local, both for what you could call privacy reasons or what I would call you know, sort of bounds of information flow or where information should flow to reasons, but also because not everybody believes everything. People believe things in contextual ways that are based on the respect that they have, which differs across people for different types of institutions. And so blockchain was asking the right question, but it, uh, but it had sort of the wrong uh, answer for that question. Right. And I guess, does it seem to say as two things, one, that it's not that there's one true self or a not self that exists on a continuum and, and, and same as it relates to truth or, or that it's local rather than global? But the other hand, doesn't it kind of seem like we are on the path towards like a Yelp for people? <laughs> well, I actually would say we're, we should be on more of a path that's more similar to a Netflix for people rather than Yelp for people. The problem with Yelp is that there's one global rating for everyone that appears for everyone who looks at that restaurant. On Netflix, there's a personalized rating that you get. And that personalized rating has to do with the interaction between the film and uh, your tastes or your needs. And I think that's what we need much more. I think having just like a stack ranking of everyone in the world is, is dystopian. Whereas having a sort of evaluation of how good of a match different people are for others depending on their personal needs, that's what we should hope for. Yeah, yeah. I would actually go one step further and say that, uh, you know, even there in the Netflix example, you have a sort of, you know, structure ontology from the top down. I think you're looking for more like, you know, a web of people that you can search on it. And same way you described earlier, you know, Google basically be able to find the most relevant page. I think we're talking about is having enough information about people in a sort of connected web that you can basically search across this graph and find the most relevant people locally, you know, for that query in the context. But, um, you know, I, I think even trying to create any sort of set of ontology is, is never going to work in advance. Yeah. I mean, the Netflix is, is too simple. I agree, Tomer, but it's, it's, it's like a, it's an important step closer than, than the like global Yelp rating is, I think. Right. Is it fair to say it's it's not about the the binary sort of self or or not self or the binary truth or or not truth, but sort of like truthiness score that we should be after? Relational truth. You know, the thing is, like, things are going to be differently true to different people depending on their set of social relations and context. For example, to an economist versus to a sociologist, different evaluations or different statements about many of the things we've been talking about would make more sense. And they even talk in different languages because of that. And you need to have systems that are capable of understanding the fact that truth is not this global thing, that it stands in relationship to the communities that we participate in and the needs that we have as individuals, but individuals who are part of these different social groups. And, and yeah, that's what's wrong about blockchain is everything is either on the blockchain or it's not on the blockchain. Whereas in, in social life, different things are said by different groups of people and we each form our evaluations of the truth 
of things based on the set of people that we trust who are willing to attest to those things being true. This is a bit of a, a social example uh, that may or may not ha- have some relevance, but we were talking about Netflix. Let's say it's someone like uh, Aziz Ansari, maybe in, in this in a world where we uh, think about identity the way we've been discussing. You know, right now there's sort of there's been this question of can you separate art from the artist in in this future world? Do you, uh, how would people take uh, this example of hey, I, I don't know if I can watch this person's comedy because of what he does in his di- a totally different part of his life, or take this person's opinions on this seriously because of their you know ridiculous opinions on this other category? How do we think we might look at that in the future? Well, you know, I, I think that's 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 a tough one to say, right? I think it has to do with sort of how we in the future sort of assign reputation, right, and credit in a sense, and how well we kind of link projects. You know, I, I would I would definitely say that these things kind of, uh, you know, have to do with sort of how much is out there, meaning that if we're going to look at, for example, the work of Susan Sari and kind of the comedy work, we're looking at sort of a lot, a lot of work out there. And I think right now we're seeing this happening with Netflix and others where content creation is again sort of skyrocketing. We're seeing more and more. I, I think actually in that context, it's, it's, it's a little less important. I think it becomes important for certain communities, but I think, you know, uh, as, as, you know, the entire amount of content grows is just, we start having more, you know, limited communities that, that think differently about this stuff. I think that, you know, in sort of this more global landscape, you're going to see people who can actually, in a sense, piss off communities in one part of the world or in one part uh, of, of certain interest groups, but then have, you know, you know, really strong followings in others. So, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, identity, in a sense, actually makes that worse. I think it makes it, it makes it that people find audiences that are more receptive to, to what they're actually putting out there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think whether you would link these issues as you were talking about Eric or not will differ across people, you know, people will be capable of recommending things to others without attesting to everything else about themselves. And in other contexts, those elements might be relevant and someone will ask for them to be attested to, and that will effectively be sort of a negotiation between those people. And that, determines sort of how intimate they are with each other at some level, not, not in a physical sense, but in a, in a you know, social sense, uh, because we share more about ourselves, prove more about ourselves to the people that we're very close to and less to those who we're further from. It's kind of Glenn's point. You can imagine a world where like, you know, imagine going to Quora and imagine every single answer on Quora uh, has one statement of truth next to it that you know is like absolutely true. There's no way that's a lie, right? And that's the reason this person is able to answer this question. So I think you would then judge the answer to the question based on like how much you believe that single statement of truth, right? Or how strong is that truth? For example, someone says, here's my medical advice. I, you know, work at, and it's like the top hospital. And you know, that's going to be hundred percent true. You might take that differently than, you know, I got this degree from a hospital you don't really know or not really sure about. And so I, I do think that if you look at it as sort of the one statement of truth, the more that we actually can rely on statements to be true, uh, the more we only need like one or two in order to make a decision of how well we accept that sort of the recommendation. Again, just imagine every place in core you go to, if there was only one statement, how likely would you be to, to take that answer? Yeah. And in fact, in, in some future version of Quora, those statements might differ depending on who is viewing them because you might want to reveal the minimum amount about yourself possible to people while still providing what's necessary for them to be able to trust you. So you could even imagine some sort of personalized version where like the relevant statement that shows up is actually related to the social network of the person viewing Cora at that moment. Because some people might know about particular hospitals, some people might know about degree granting institutions, other people might know about particular famous surgeries that have been performed and you could know that this person is the one who performed that. I think that the world, when we have systems like this, could really be quite remarkable and rich and different. I mean, another example would be in medicine. Imagine that you had a personal journal where all of the your medical information was recorded and links to all the doctors who actually performed those procedures or verified that information about you was there. Then you could potentially go in and receive medical care, never really share anything about your identity, but share precisely the elements of your medical history through these relationships to the doctors that were necessary for them to provide the you know, service they do, did to you, then they could verify those things. You could get this incredibly personalized thing that really is minimally invasive in terms of 
what you're sharing and yet much more accurate, portable, and trusted than existing uh, data systems are. Right. And, and actually, you know, uh, bringing this back to a, a much earlier point as well, which is that this kind of personalization from a society standpoint has the effect of really creating a, a true level playing field. You know, one of the problems of the internet is that it was supposed to be able to sort of flatten the world and bring everyone to one place and sort of create the equal opportunities, but, but it really didn't, not to the extent it could have. And I think part of the reason is because, you know, we can't just put out a rule that's a programmatic rule that says, you know, so, you know anyone who has sort of this background can apply here or can work there or can get this offering. We still have a lot of sort of human interpretation in the middle. And so I think to, to Glenn's point is when we have that kind of reliance where we can rely on sort of these custom statements of truth for individuals, we can, you know, provide a true level playing field where all individuals who meet certain requirements get the same automatic opportunities. And we kind of actually deliver on a lot of the promises the internet originally had made. In, in some ways, I see this as productizing or, 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 or putting structure to sort of Paul Graham's old adage of uh, keep your identity small and sort of protecting us against sort of a, some of our natural uh, bugs we have around identity, whether it's like fundamental attribution error, you know, like binary thinking, prepackaged beliefs, f- fight or flight mode, you know, seeing people as fixed static instead of sort of dynamic, uh, ever changing or having the ability to change. Does that resonate? Yeah, I agree. Glenn, you recently had a uh, Twitter thread around the need for us to sort of uh, redefine money in some sense, partially because what it does is to treat relationships and treat everything as, as fungible when obviously we all have different, different values for, for things and maybe things that can't be reduced to money. Can you talk about a little bit of the, the, the problem you are outlining there and, and maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the way I think about it is that money is a model of something. It's like a formal model of something like barter. Like, you know, I give you something, you're going to give me something back in return. The reality is most things we do in social situations are not like barter. We do things that benefit many other people other than ourselves, not just one other person. And the more we live on networks, the more that we have, you know, insights into knowledge, production of new technologies that benefit lots of people, the more that things are like that. And money is just very bad at accounting for things like that. So, you know, one thing that I um, have been working on with Vitalik Buterin and Zoe Hitzig is a system for funding organizations that tries to account for benefits they bring to many people in a way that money doesn't, uh, what, what economists call public goods. And that, that system ends up not just valuing every dollar that's contributed the same. Instead, it values dollars that come from many different people more than a lot of dollars coming from one person. So in particular, it has this mathematical form where the amount received by the organization is the square of the sum of the square roots contributed. But you don't have to follow that formula. The idea is just basically that if 100 people each give $1, the organization is going to get a lot more than if one person gives $100. And once you start having something like that, the notion of people having separate identities ends up becoming incredibly important. But even the simple notion of just treating each individual human being as separate is not quite right, because if you think about it, you know, imagine that husband and wife each give one dollar into a system. Should you treat that as one dollar given by each of two different people? or $2 given by one family? Well, it's not totally clear. And in fact, when you go to the next level of abstraction beyond that, well, you could say, what about people who are members of the same church, people who are members of the same company? These are problems that are being faced by people who are actually using the types of systems I'm describing. And you actually need some way to describe the social relationships among people in order to really design a thoughtful way of capturing more than money does, of actually saying this is giving benefit to these groups of people because the more diverse those groups of people are, the harder time they're going to have sort of coordinating through these types of mechanisms. And the more you want to treat contributions from such a diverse group as really sort of these things from separate people that you want to subsidize because 
of the difficulty that they have sort of providing a public good together. So once you start going down that route, and, and I know it's a little bit uh, elaborate, you start to realize that really what we care about is not this fungible thing of money that is the same no matter how, who gives it, but rather about this rich nonlinear combination of value and identity, not viewed as a completely individualistic separated thing, but viewed as a function of our relationships with others. And so that really creates, I think, a, a fundamentally world, different world than sort of a simple capitalist world where $1 is $1. The, the quote you, had, you ended it with is, money is to social value roughly as cave painting is to vision. Uh, ridiculous simplification. We've moved past cave painting to photography, movies, and VR, and we need to do the same for money and how we imagine social value. Exactly. I mean, I think in, in, in the world we're going to hopefully head into soon, I really do hope that this unidimensional money thing is going to be replaced by a rich interaction of information systems like those that Tomer and others are building with tokens of value, but which are filtered and twisted through all those social relations, which is really, if you think about it, the way that just everyday life works. You know, It's not like you just assign a dollar value to every action that somebody else takes. You think about how hard it was for them in that context, how that relates to, you know, how independent it was from other people's contributions. And you form a complex sense of what you owe to someone in terms of respect and esteem based on all of those things. And if we can start to get systems for tracking social value that capture more of that, we can have a much more productive society than we can if we try to reduce everything to this one dimensional money thing. Is there some degree of thinking behind all this that we can, with better numbers, better math, we can quantify what previously we thought of as unquantifiable or that it's even, we can even approximate in a way that it is constructive? And this idea is a sort of materialist worldview that everything is somewhat reducible um, if, if, we, if we get better and better at it and we should, we should try, to, try to quantify even the things that well, are I, I, don't, I don't know that I would say everything is reducible. I don't think we know. But I think like virtual reality, like th th those richer forms of representation better than cave painting, I think if we're able to simplify less using the incredibly powerful information systems we have, rather than just scale everything up, which is mostly what we've been focusing on, I think we'll be using our technology much more effectively and we'll live in a much more humane society, you know, in the same way that if we're able to communicate with each other more richly and completely using things like virtual reality, we'll, I think, achieve a lot more than if all that we do is just scale up databases or have more powerful artificial intelligence algorithms. But, but even so, do you imagine... You know, yeah. What markets do, among other things, is, is make everything legible. And do you imagine how much I like you becoming legible, or what I you know, think about you in all these different aspects, or, or some of the things that social value that really exist, but today we don't are not legible and 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 don't become quantified. Do you, do you imagine those becoming more legible and quantified over time? Well, I, I not not in a way that's collected by some single central entity, because I, you know, as I was describing it, all, all this stuff will have this very personalized view. And, and I think, and this is again, a slight difference from Tomer, I think it can be stored in a very decentralized way and, and, and actually be run, you know, sort of using local graph analysis and so forth. But I, I don't think it needs to be viewed from a central point in the same way. But I think for each of us, we'll have the capability as well of these powerful computers at our hands to store that sort of personalized, rich social reality more closely for people very far away from us in a way we can't right now. You know, there's something called the Dunbar number, which is the, it's like 150 or something like that. The number of like stable, rich friendships and social relations you're able to maintain at any given time. And that puts a hard limit on the number of people we can have this sort of rich, complicated, much more valuable sociality with at present. And I think these new information systems will allow us to maintain something closer to that with thousands or perhaps even millions of people in a way that hasn't been possible uh, until recently. 
one counter to this is someone uh, is um, I, I can't remember if it's Goodhart's law. Basically, once something becomes a metric, it, it, it or a measure or quantified, it, it ceases, it loses some of its value. Oh, I couldn't agree with that more. So I, I don't at all believe that the system that I'm describing is an endpoint or that we don't have to continually look back to our informal social relations and ask what are our formal systems missing about them. So my, my, what I'm advocating for is definitely not replacing those 150 relationships we have with these quantified systems. Instead, I think that what we need to do is constantly try to do a better job of modeling those 150 relationships so that the relationships that we have with the million other people are increasingly less thin. I think Goodhart's law has, you know, applies more than anything to the incredibly thin systems we have, like, you know, the government issues you an ID card or, you know, you have money and that's the only descriptor of you. I think that's the system that's been incredibly worn down and sort of turned into a parody of itself. And we need to start to move beyond that. But I don't think we should imagine that any one step we take to move beyond that has solved the problem. We'll have to continually be looking back to those informal, pre-formal social relations and trying to do a better and better job of mapping them. So how do we get past this, this paradox, though, of, you know, you care about what you can measure, what you measure matters, but what really matters in life often can't be uh, reduced or can't be measured. And you could try to have better measures of it, or you can uh, try to value it in different ways without measuring it. How would we do some version of, of the latter? Well, the problem is I don't think you can do the latter beyond about 150 people. I think that's the fundamental problem. I think informal systems are great. They do a much better job than formal systems, but they don't scale. So if we want to have cooperation at scale, the only choice we have is to try to imitate that those much higher fidelity informal things in a scalable way. You know, I don't think we have the option, like vision and hanging out in person with you, Eric, would be much more fun than talking to you over this podcast, but it's just not an option that I have for talking to you from New York where I'm recording with you in California. So I think if we want to continue to have that sort of cooperation, the best we can hope for is to continually ask what are the elements of being with you there in person that this is missing and not fool ourselves into thinking we've got it all, but constantly try, try to improve. So how do we retain, uh, how do we ever take it into in terms of retaining the benefits of, of scale? Um, you know, this, uh, this paradox shows up in a different way, which is sort of the richer we get or the more, uh, you know, the better markets do, the, do their thing, the more communities also break down. So how do we sort of keep the thing, retain the things that help us uh, scale and, and produce economic growth while also retaining sort of the different, the, the behaviors we have in the marketplace versus the behaviors we have in our communities and intimate families and with 150 people, the things that, you know, intentionally shouldn't scale. How do we have both of those minds at the same time? I mean, I, I think that hopefully no one will want to choose to escape into the virtual world because it just becomes such a good simulacrum of the real world. And I think a technological practice, which constantly tells us things are missing from that formal world and the, and technology is at least as much about going back to that informal world and trying to do a better job at it constantly about trying to attend better to that world. If we have a technological practice that's built around that rather than exclusively or primarily just about scaling, then we're going to be constantly reminded of the value, even for the purposes of advancing technology, of understanding better those relationships so that there will actually be a complementarity between the depth that we go into in those intimate relations and the way in which that allows us to then scale up cooperation in a higher fidelity way um, outside of those local relations. So, so you know, transitioning to, to a close here, maybe a couple, couple last questions. W one is broadly, what are the, the questions that, that you uh, still have, Glenn, that you're trying to figure out right now that you wish you had you know, answers to or directions to? Uh, and I'm curious, 
I, I bet a bunch of them are on the implementation level, you know, uh, technologically or, or even so- socially or culturally. But I'm also curious if there are any on the sort of philosophical, more you know, more fundamental assumptions level that you're still wrestling with, and that if there are people who have different fundamental assumptions that you, you think are just as reasonable as yours, but might lead them to different conclusions on the implementation level. Well, I mean, the truth is that the further I get along thinking about all of these things, the more really fundamental questions that I'm struggling with and trying to come to the right answers for. You know, I tried to sketch out some of the agenda that I was after, but the truth is, you know, many of the solutions that I've proposed in the past, quadratic voting, some of these property rules, the more I understand, the more I realize that they're important components of an eventual answer, but they're not, they're, they're very, very far from being an endpoint. We don't have uh, ways of thinking about identity, just as I was talking about earlier, that really reflect that full set of social connections that I now increasingly think is necessary if you want to have, you know, mechanisms that actually work for coordinating cooperation. I, like, I don't know how to describe that. I'm, I'm working on it and I'm trying to figure it out. I don't think we have ways, for example, of describing what I would call cultural capital or status, you know, and thinking about how do we tax that? Uh, th- that's a huge open question that I'm trying to struggle and talking to some people about. We don't have good ways of describing in formal language um, the process of conversation that we're having, which is not linear. It's not just like adding up votes. It's some process of exchanging thoughts and coming to new thoughts that none of us had from, you know, out of that. Um, So there are many of these sort of fundamental questions that aren't about implementation, but are really about the type of society we want to live in that I think are very much open and and that I'm struggling with. And do you have, when you say society we want to live in, do you have a point of view on, you know, how much is it, like, is the end point, how much is it, you know, a just and equal world? and not that these are exclusive anyway, but sometimes they're trade-off, versus, versus a prosperous world versus, uh, like, what is sort of the end point or utopia kind of, maybe utopia is the wrong word, but like what end goals kind of look like for you? Well, I don't, I don't view there as being an end point. And I don't view just and equal versus prosperous as really fundamentally being different things. I think most inequality is a result of us treating a lot of the, collective value that we create is like the private property of some person. And I think that's also incredibly inefficient and leads to, you know, really poor economic outcomes and not, not us not even being able to measure what we mean by prosperity because, you know, prosperity is based on some metric in a marketplace. That's not even measuring the right things. It's not measuring the public goods. It's not measuring the value of the information that we receive you know, it's not valuing innovation. So if we're going to actually have prosperity, getting systems that are actually capable of measuring that, which require accounting for the collective nature of so much of the value, which in turn would create a much more equal society, those things are all just part of the same way of, of fixing what's broken about the system. And none of them is an end point. They're all further progress to both scaling up how the distances over which we can collaborate, but also having a better map of what collaboration means uh, in the first place. And and for to you know someone like Tyler Cowen or, or people who say that it's it's our goal should be to to focus on GDP, even though it's not a perfect measure, it correlates with a lot of the things that we we care about. Would you say that the fundamental assumption you have is that or difference of opinion is that it, it doesn't, <laughs> or that it, that it's really uh, well? I mean, you you talked about Goodhart's law before. GDP is the ultimate example of that. The more we maximize GDP, the less it corresponds to the things that we actually care about. And, you know, like you take, take an example in like news quality. If somebody discovers, like it makes an awesome cat video, they'll make much more money most likely than if they have verifiable proof that Donald Trump takes daily orders from Vladimir Putin. I mean, this is just because, you know, it's all about dwell time. That has nothing to do with the value of information. The most fundamental public goods, the greatest inventions, the things that Tyler would celebrate most are the things that are measured worst by the market um, as we currently have it. 
and the more time goes by, the worse that measurement's getting. So if we don't innovate in the most fundamental aspects of our society that allow for innovation themselves in our institutions, uh, we're just going to be optimizing more and more to a broken Goodhart's Law met- metric. Where, where can you point listeners to who, who want to learn more, Glenn and Tomer? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we post everything on merits.com. And uh, check out radicalexchange.org or at radexchange on Twitter. Uh, Glenn and Tomer, this, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on. Take care. Bye-bye. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst.